The game is played mental. I don't care who you are. You got to have a mentality to be able to be successful. That's what we want, man. We want people to be able, man, to stay focused when it's time. That's where your success comes from. If you lose your focus, man, you probably lose whatever you're trying to accomplish. That's where greatness comes from. Greetings, and welcome to another episode of Hall of Famers, HOFs, the podcast, where greatness is the standard. I'm C. Lamont Smith, your host, and I'm joined today by my co-host, Mr. Robert Scoop Jackson. Scoop is a columnist for the Chicago Sun-Times. He's also a former writer and producer for ESPN, and he is the author of the forthcoming book with today's guest. Speaking of today's guest, he is a very special one. Our guest today is a four-time NBA scoring champion. He was selected All-NBA on five separate occasions. He finished his career with 26,595 combined points between the NBA and the ABA. He was selected to both the NBA's 50th and 75th anniversary teams. He's a member of the Naismith Hall of Fame we like to have, we have the privilege and the honor of welcoming George the Iceman Gervin. Ice, how are you, man? Hey, man, I'm doing good, Mark. How you doing, buddy? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I'm so happy to, uh, to have you join us today. It's just a great privilege and an honor and got Scoop on here who, uh, as I mentioned, is working on your book. So this is pretty special, man. Oh, yeah, well, it was pretty special, man, for me to have Scoop work on my book, you know. Um, I had uh, quite a few other people wanted to, you know, I could say had that opportunity to do it, man, but I preferred Scoop because I felt Scoop could understand my language. And I think it's so important to get people to understand you. And he was the perfect guy for me, so I appreciate him too. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, I, I guess I want to. I want to start. I want to go back a little bit and um, establish some frameworks right here. Now, when you played both in the ABA and the NBA, you measured six feet seven inches. Is that I got that right? Yeah. Well, yeah, six eight. I mean, it don't matter. I mean, that that inch didn't really matter to me because uh, I had skills. Okay. Okay. Well, that's what I want to kind of get into, because is it true that in high school as a sophomore, you were only five feet, eight inches tall? Yeah, five foot nine, man. I saw, you know, freshman, I was five nine. And the next year, I was six six. Freshman year, you were five <laughs> nine. And the next year, you were six six. Just like that. Wow. You know, I mean, it almost makes you think, man, that, you know, I put dirt in my shoes and watered it and just grew. I mean. Well, <laughs> well, well obviously, you, 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 know, you wanted to play ball at that time. I researched and, you know, yeah, I, I guess there was some issue at, at Martin Luther King High School where they were talking about cutting you. How did it impact you when you were 5'9 and a quote unquote short guy at that time? Did that mess with your, your head and your confidence at that time? Well, I mean, it could have. I mean, I five nine, I was little, you know. I mean, I could dribble, you know. I mean, I had the skills. I mean, but I was real little, you know, five nine, skinny, and and high school coach at that time, he saw that I had some skills and that I just needed some time, and so he put me on the reserves. So the reserves play after the varsity. So you know, the varsity will play, and then the reserves will come on and play after it. So each team in the PSL, Public School League, had a varsity team and had a reserve team. We will play the weaker guys, that's what they call us, you know, after the, the big game that the varsity played. So, you know, I, I just did that, man. That's how I stayed on the team. Wow. Well, th th that next year, and I, and I know Scoop's going to jump, but that next year, I assumed that you were on varsity that next year since you were 6'6". Six, six. I came back to school, 
because the coach was going to retire. Okay. You know, I get assistant coach the job. But the assistant coach, Merweather, when I came back, he started telling something, you got to go look at George, you know, and he came to watch me and he didn't retire. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, knew a good thing I mean, when he saw it. Yeah. I mean, it's quite sort of like Popovich did when he saw Victor. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, I'm not going to take the first round pick. You exactly. know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, I mean, he, the kid is talented. I was talented, you know. I mean, I, I had skills when I was five nine. you know. I mean, and then I practiced all the time. You know, I was a gym rat. You know, so when I got taller, I was still able to bring them skills with me. You know, man, I mean, I, I love the game, man. So I worked at it. And, and you know, the assistant coach, you know, he used to work out with me, you know. And, you know, he taught me my fundamentals. I was fundamentally sound as a freshman. And then I grew and was fundamentally sound as a sophomore. So they were in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I, I'd say so. 26,000 points. Yeah, they definitely were in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lamont, but the one thing he's not telling you is he had older brothers that would beat him down that he had to go through in order to find that early greatness. Uh, even at 5'9", but even when he got 6'6", six, six, he had older brothers that were giving him the business. Oh, so, yeah. yeah, so when it came time to play on, on, on the team, I could tell you that I know from talking to George was that... Um, that was easy compared to what his brothers put him through. But right, really, right. <laughs> mm -hmm, that was easy yeah. what his brothers had to put him through. Yeah. I mean, I mean, and then, man, everybody, you know, and Scoop, though, I always say everybody needs a somebody. My brothers was my somebody. Mm. You know, my brothers gave me the confidence, you know, because uh, my brothers beat me down. You know, they never let me win. I didn't understand it. I mean, uh, I kept trying to win, but they never would let me win. But that day came. Well, no more. He can do nothing with me. Yeah, you know, that, that, that was going to be one of my questions was, you know, <laughs> was there an event or something that happened where that switch clicked and you said, I'm that guy right now? And yeah, was there something when you really gained your confidence and there was nothing that was going to take that away? When I went to college, you know, and because he used to come up. And we used to play one-on-one. -on -one. You know, I'm a big one-on-one -on -one guy. It was my turn. You know, because I'm 6'6 six, six now, you know, going to be 6'7, and he was still 5'11. Okay. Maybe stretching six. Okay. You know, so he, he did what he's supposed to do. He got me right. You okay. know, and he was the kind of guy that, you know, always said, man, you can't beat me until you beat me. And then after I beat him, he didn't believe I beat him. I mean, you know, 10 to 12, we going to 12, I won. But, you know, he wasn't that kind of guy. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. <laughs> you know, so sure. I owe a lot to him, man. I mean, my high school coach, assistant coach, my two brothers, they got me right. You know, they got me right for what I didn't know what I was on my way to. You know, but they got me right for when I got there. Hey, George, could you talk also about some of the players that you witnessed, some of the great players you witnessed coming up in Detroit at that time? A little bit older than you, but there was always greatness around you because you were playing basketball in one of the best basketball cities in the country. Man, you start thinking about it, man. You start thinking about Spencer Haywood. We all know who Spence was. You know, then you had Ralph Simpson. You know, and then you had my brother, Booker Gervin. Dominic got named Leo Tolan. Larry Fogel, you know, I mean, one I think is one of the greatest guards, man, to ever play, Curtis Jones. Curtis Jones has never really been talked about on the level that he deserved. And he was real special, man. I, I remember seeing him in my senior year, no, my junior year, when they played the All-Star game at my high school in Martin Luther King in Detroit. And he got 25 assists. I mean, the things that he was doing, I ain't ever seen anybody do it anymore. You know, and I've been around the game a long time, man. Scoop know a little bit about Oh, I know Curtis, a lot about Curtis, Jay. I did a big story on Curtis. He, he, uh, he, he won a city championship with four football players, Lamont. <laughs> what? 
Yes. Man, he was hey. special, man. And he, and he was only 5'9". Yes, sir. The mind, he'll do this, and somebody laying it up. What? Yeah. That's how special he was. I mean, he'll actually do this. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like, man, the ball just go through everybody and to the right guy, and he laying it up. That's how special he was, man. And, you know, one of them unfortunate situations, man, that, you know, he really didn't just get a chance, man, to show the nation how great he was. I mean, we got a lot of stories like that, man. But I come up in a basketball mecca, you know, like Scoop said, man. Um, you know, we always talk about New York guys and the, and the Detroit guys. I say the Detroit guys knew how to score. The New York guys knew how to dribble. I, I <laughs> hit a lot of guys. <laughs> take, I got to take offense to that. You know, I ain't mentioned Chicago guys, but I always talked about Detroit and, and, and New York and the difference is putting that ball in the hole. So no doubt about it. And also it. real quick, talk about Dave Bean because he wasn't even from Detroit, but you got to see him as a Detroit Piston and the impact that that had on you and the influence somebody watching, you know, Dave Bean play for the Pistons. You know, how they, Dave, how they man, resonated with you as a young guy. You know, my high school senior year all-star game, they coached me. And I got MVP, you know. So, you know, I grew up watching Dave. You know, they had um, they had um, their camps before the season at Eastern Michigan. You know, so, you know, I got a chance to know Dave. But then when I, you know, was getting ready to graduate, we had the All-Star game at the Olympic Stadium in Detroit, man. I got MVP. i never forget this, man. This was Dave being told me, man, as a high schooler. He said, boy, if you keep playing like that, you're going to play against me. Man, you know, I now, okay, now I'm 71. I was 18. So we talk about impact. You know, we start talking about, you know, young guys. I mean, and we're talking to the older guys. The impact that you can really have on a young person's life by what you say to them, positive or negative. Now I'm 71 again. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so, and, and I say that with passion. Sure. I never forgot him saying that. Wow. And I got a chance to play with him before he retired, play against him. You know, so I come up, man. I come up in basketball, man. And, you know, and I'm thankful, man. I'm thankful I was born and raised in Detroit, man, in that tough city. And, you know, which was young, man. It wasn't tough for me. I mean, because, you know, that's where I live. But what it gave me, you know, and the uh, people in my life, it, it gave me that confidence and, and that self-esteem that I could move forward with what I had as my tool, and my tool was my game. As a young player coming up in a basketball mecca like that, what type of unique things did you work on to perfect your craft and become great? I know you said that you were a big one-on-one -on -one guy, and, and I get that, but when you were in the lab by yourself. Uh, you were known for your finger roll, for example, okay, when you played. I saw you do that many, many times against the Hawks when I was living in Atlanta. But what was unique and special about what you would do when you were going to the lab? Use both of them. I had two hands and I was able to use both of them, you know, so I can go either way I wanted to go. You know, I fundamentally sound, I always was on balance. You know, I'm known for the finger roll, but I really should be known for shooting that jumper. Right. You know, it's artistic is the finger roll, man, but consistency is shooting that J. You know, think about it today, man. If you can score and shoot, you're a superstar. You know, you know, I mean, because how the game is played today and stuff is position. Oh, he just can shoot. You make him drive, he might trip. But if you leave him wide open, he might not miss. In the day I was coming up, most of our guys can do that, dribble and shoot, you know what I mean? So when I'm in the lab and I ain't mind being in there, that's all I worked on. And then I had imagination. You know, my imagination is imagine playing against somebody and then, you know, working my game around that scenario. You know, I think imagination is big. When you would be in there, who would you project yourself playing against? Who would you see yourself playing when against? I, you know, and when I got in the league, Kareem. Okay. Because I like to go to the hole. Okay. So, you know, in order to go to the hole against Kareem, I'd come up with something special, you know, and stuff. So, you know, if you see some of my highlights and stuff, you can see me going to the hole. 
You know, yeah, I used to say, don't get it, Korean. He, he, he got this in his book. I used to tell me, don't get it. He knew I couldn't touch that. <laughs> you, know, so, you know, so for me, I'm going back to the way you said. I got all that preparation in the lab. You know, I mean, um, I took it serious. You know, I mean, I tell school, and I told them in the book. I ain't just love the game. I was in love with it. Mm. It's a separation. You know, you you know, you've been around the game. You know some of your guys you represented was just loving it. Mm -hmm. And then you knew some that was in love with it. Cause it wasn't nothing they couldn't do wasn't nothing they wouldn't do to get better. No doubt. You no. know, so that for having that kind of passion helped me be more artistic and effective. Hey, George, was being, do you feel that being in love with the game and not just loving it, being in love with the game and coming up in Detroit kind of helped you to not fall into some of the traps that were, you know, just coming up in the inner city? Well, I think that and also leadership. You know, at that time, my mom, you know, my mom kept me in programs coming up. You know what I'm saying? She knew it. She knew the pitfalls and the. Uh, and the traps and the holes that you'll fall on if you ain't busy. Mm -hmm. So she kept us busy. You know, I stayed in programs. You know, we are all kind of, pro all, is there the program in the city? I was in it. You know what I mean? So for that aspect, you know, I still think that's the key. You know, who's, who's in your household? You know what I'm saying? I only hit brains by a single parent. You know, you have children. You know, and your wife, and you know, I don't know your situation, Same. other mind, but I, I know your leadership is what get them where they need to go. Now it's still up to them, but your guidance. My mom always told me, treat people like you want to be treated, and you ain't gonna have very many problems. So my mom gave me values, gave me morals, and she gave me principles to live by. That's what helped me not fall in them pitfalls. Beautiful. And yeah, yeah, we see that today, and that's a real challenge because you you give a young man, uh, you know, hundred million dollars, two hundred million dollars, a uh, lot of temptation out there to go the wrong way if you don't have that solid foundation behind you. And it's good to hear you say that you had that behind you. Someone could help you with that as you were moving forward. Yeah. Let's talk about the ABA. Okay. Uh, I know that's near and dear to your heart. That's sort of where you started. How much of today's NBA game do you see that is remnants from the ABA? Well, not all of it, no. <laughs> I mean, you, you know, they score a lot of points. We score a lot of points. You know, before the merger in 76, you know, statistically, you could probably see it yourself. They average 80, 90 points. You know, it's like watching paint dry on the wall. You know what I mean? For youngsters, seeing what the league have grown to be today. ABA was entertainment. What is the league called today? The Spurs is called San Antonio Spurs Sports and Entertainment. They selling entertainment now. You know, see, so really they selling ABA basketball whether they want to say it or not. Got a three-point line. I know if the big three didn't have a a, a four-point line, they'll have that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, you, know what I'm saying? you know what I'm saying? I mean, so it's all about entertainment now. You know, and I, I am so proud to be a part of the foundation, man, to see where this game has grown. You know how people always say, man, wow, man, don't you wish you had played? And heck no. And I ain't wish I played now. I had my turn. I, I, I am thoroughly happy, man, I mean, um, with my life at this stage in my life, you know. So it's they turn now, you know, so they got to figure it out. Now, if they come to a brother like me, I try to help them. I ain't going out seeking, you know, to help you. I mean, because, you know, with these young kids today, you didn't already say it, man, they make $100 million. You know, that money make them. You know, money ain't nothing make me. I made money. It's a Big difference. You know, you give a kid, man, $100 million, man, he ain't never had nothing. 
He was in welfare line. And all of a sudden, man, he give him a hundred million dollars. Man, what are you gonna do? You know, I mean, you can't help but to get lost. You know, so I wouldn't wanna be playing in this era because all it would be saying is you want to play in this era to make a lot of money. Well, the game changed. The game ain't played like it when I was playing. You know, I mean, so. Man, I had my turn, man. I mean, I'm so proud to be a part of the ABA, man. And the ABA is the foundation of what this league is today, whether or not they want to say it or not. You know, we are the foundation, man. The game took off when we merged in 76. You know, now they could push whatever narratives they want and say it was magic and bird. And, uh-uh. I ain't taking nothing from magic and bird. But you can't take away from my boys either. You know, there may be eight guys that came in here, man. Do your homework. Most people don't like to research. Do your homework, man, after 77 and see who was on the all-star team. Oh, yeah. And see how many of us was there. Sure. I'm, you know, I'm talking to your listeners. You know what I'm saying? Because I know y'all probably already know. But I'm talking to your listeners. Now, that's how important ABA was to this league is today. You know, so... Yeah, I'm proud, man. Uh, man, we had a number of young, young gunners in the ABA. You know, we had average 115. Some of us average 120. I mean, you had to be, you had to be doing this, moving up and down, to get that done. The game changed. Also, you think about it when Golden State won from the three point line. So it changed from inside to outside. Now, where is it one from? It's one from the three-point line. You know, one from outside shooting. You ain't got too many people that play with their back to the basket like when I played. You know what I mean? I, and all the ones that can don't want to be down there. Right. <laughs> they want to shoot that J. <laughs> you know, so, you know, the game has changed, man, and, and, and I ain't mad at it. You know, I, I ain't mad at it, man. Um, but I do know this. I know I ain't played in 40 years. And if you say ice, somebody going to say Joe Gurley. Now that guy that made $300 million, and you call his name, they're going to say, who? See, because he ain't entertained like our boys in the ABA. You know, I say that with confidence. Sure. You know, a lot of these guys, man, that played with me, man, is legendary. You know what I mean? And I'm yeah. proud of them, man. I, I really am, man. I'm proud of coming out of that league. Sure. Let me ask you this, Ice. Two questions. Best player you ever played against and the player they gave you the biggest challenge defensively that was trying to guard you. I'm biased. Best player I played against was Julius Erber. The best guy that guarded me was a few. You know, uh, Ain't none of them stopped me from getting 30, so I don't know what, you know what I'm saying? Right. I mean, it's all relative. Dennis, yeah. <laughs> Dennis Johnson, Michael Cooper, Bobby Jones, T.R. Dunn. Mm-hmm. You know, them four guys I could think all right off the top. You know, I used to tell Dennis Johnson, man, I used to say, man, Dennis, man, you the best to guard me. He said, well, I didn't know. I, I couldn't tell after the game. But Dennis was probably the, the guy that guarded me the best. His size, he didn't go for fakes. He stayed down, he stayed in front of you and stuff. So, you know, them the guys, man, that, you know, I would say that on the defensive end. But, you know, Doc, you know, I'm I'm biased towards him because I grew up, you know, uh, as a young pro under him. You know, but you got a lot of them, man. I mean, I mean, you think about it, man. I tell you a guy, man, that they don't talk about Alex English. I, I represented Alex uh, his last year here in Denver. That's one of my. I just don't claim him as a Hall of Famer because I only did one year with him. But yeah, Alex. Hey man, they, come on, man. That brother, yeah. man, what seven years? Mm-hmm. Seven years, two thousand points. Yeah, maybe eight. Yeah. Find somebody in the books that didn't accomplish that. Right. Yeah. It, it that, won't be. You can't fill it. You can't fill the hand up. No. I didn't do it. That, that, that little feather jumper right off the baseline down there. Hey, man, filling on, it up. Man, I mean, so, you know, when you start talking about the guys that I play, man, come on, man, David D. You know, come on, man. I mean, I could come up scoring. 
You know, Kiki Vandaway. You know, I mean, come on, scorn. Billy Knight. You want to talk about, you know, you got another guy get 30 on your stuff, man. You say, Billy, man, how you do that? He, and he'll tell you, I don't know. <laughs> but you got 30 something. So, it's so many guys, man, that I played against, man, that need to be recognized, you know. And anytime I get a chance, and Scoop, you know, man, Scoop, talk about it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you. She go, everybody ain't gonna tell you. She I'm gonna, go, you know, I'm gonna throw Roger Brown's name in there too, George Scott. And, I, and I'll go, I'll go on him next. Yep, I figured you were. Yep. Hey, mm -hmm. I'll go on Joy McGinnis. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. Without a doubt. Yes, sir. Come on, man. Joy McGinnis and the ABA dominated it. Mm-hmm. Artie Gilmore. Moses Malone as a teenager. Hey, come on, man. Yeah. Mo. Yeah. We can keep going, man, when it starts. When you I'm telling you, 76. Changed the whole aspect of NBA basketball. And if we don't talk about it, I don't think they'll talk about it. You go, look at it, man. They don't even count our points today on the all time scores. I want to say something real quick, just Lamont, I want to put this in perspective. I did once did a story on Tracy McGrady, and I think it was his second year in Orlando. And he, Finally, I think he crossed over. I think he was, I don't know if he led the league in scoring, but it was close to it, right? And I put it in perspective because I wrote, okay, what Tracy McGrady did this year in Orlando, in order for him to get to what Alex Inglis was doing, he has to have this year eight more years in a row. Because <laughs> <laughs> everybody was in love with Tracy McGrady. He's all this, that, and the other. I'm like, okay, to show you, you know, to do what Alex English did. And this is somebody we don't talk about. Yeah. Yep. To even get yeah. to Alex English's level or Adrian Danley's level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He has to have this same year eight, eight more times in a row. Not yep. total, in a row. Bro. Yeah. So Scary, ain't it? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's amazing. Hey, George, let me ask you this. Could you explain how you got the nickname Ice? You know, Fatty Taylor. You know, Fatty Taylor is always say, um, I'm from Detroit now, so, you know, I got a little money, and, you know, I'm, I'm from the inner city, so I have my style. You know, I'd be sharp. You know, I always wear gaiters, and, you know, we always dressed back then. And he always called me the Iceberg Slim. <laughs> <laughs> I would used to say all the time, he used to say, here come Iceberg Slim, man. I, used to, boy, I ain't never liked that. Right. You know what I mean? Because I said, man, you know who Iceberg Slim is, man. Yeah. They pimp, man, ain't nothing pimpish about me. Right. You know what I mean? So, uh, then but it, you did you have know, a Cadillac, though. No, Tell I, the truth. I, I, hey, with a Rolls Royce front. <laughs> 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 Think about it. Think about it, man. I came up in, a, in an environment with no dad mm -hmm. and being impressed by what I seen. What did I see in the inner city? You know what I'm saying? I mean, so that's what I emulated. You know, I mean, and that wasn't really me. You know, I have my own style, I mean, and all that, man. But that's kind of like how I got my nickname, how I played, and then my style. You know, um, I never was proud of the aspect of, of, of being you know, call um, something as degrading as uh, that situation there. You know, um, it was a lifestyle and I knew it and I knew some of them, you know, uh, uh, but that was just something fatty, called fatty from DC, you know, so another inner city, you know, so obviously he had that kind of, you know, understanding, uh, you know, I'm, Tall, slim, Cadillac, you know, I mean, come on, man, single. You know, I mean, so that's how I kind of got the name. I don't tell everybody this. So, Ice, I, I want to pick up on something you said. You know, you said that you had mixed emotions about the nickname that uh, our mutual good friend, uh, Fatty Taylor, gave you uh, back in the day. But 
having had the opportunity to see you play in person, you know, when I was a young man living in Atlanta, you kind of took that name. Like if you hadn't told us that today, I would have thought that you got that name because of your style of play. I mean, you were so unflappable on the court and so smooth uh, with what you did. And my question for you is, who in today's game reminds you of yourself? Or is there anybody in today's NBA that reminds you of yourself? You know, man, I, you know, the first guy I would think of would be Kevin Durant. But, it, and that's basically because of size. You know, I, I, we got total different games. Uh, he, he, you know, he has this greatness, you know, and I think my style was just different than it was mine. You know, I mean, I, when you look at it, I mean, I, I like go to the hole, you know, I like to use both hands, I like the right hand hook, left hand hook, I like to shoot in between jumper. I mean, I like to shoot, you know, 17, 18 foot jumpers. I mean, um, uh, <laughs> You know, so, you know, for me, I, I don't really see anybody that has the style that I had in playing in the game today. I've known people push the narrative of the finger roll. I mean, it's because how I did it, they'd say I'm the inventor of it. I'm not. You know, I got that, you know, copy from Will Doc and Connie Hawkins. I was smart mm -hmm. enough to... You know, to know I ain't have to invent the wheel. It was already invented. So I got three great Hall of Famers there, you know, that I emulated, you know, and I just took it to another level. So, you know, I, I don't see nobody playing like I played, being honest with that. Um, you know, you could go to the R guys all you want, and you probably won't see the style of play that I had uh you know, anywhere but on my own, uh, you know, videos. Ice, tell me about how you revolutionized the big guard position in the game. Wow. You know, man, that, that changed my career. You know, because I was forward. I played forward for the early part of my career. You know, I'm 185 pounds playing against guys <laughs> 250. You know, I mean... You know, 230, you know, much stronger than me. Um, and and Bob Bass, man, I never forget it, man. Bob Bass said, you know, I'm going to move you to the two guard. And I was like, I won't move to no two guard, Bob. Uh, and he was the kind of guy that said, uh, George, it, it'll just give you a lot a long, long more longevity. And we tried it. Boy, I tell you, it changed my career, man. I, boy, I started playing against them old little bitty guards, man, them 6'2", six, 6'3", six, guards, man. And, <laughs> Hosting them up and, you know, getting to spots and shooting over them. And that's why I think I became a Hall of Famer because I became consistent. You know, I could score easier. I wasn't wore out. You know, uh, the, you know they always say I ain't play no D, but I always tell them, man, they, they pay you guys to guard me, man. I wouldn't worry about no defense, <laughs> man, you know. So. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I know, man. I know what coaches did. But coaches would get mad at Johnny, Johnny Moore, who Johnny Moore and stuff, man. He'd be saying, like, man, Johnny, man, how you let Ice Man score on you? He said, well, I got to guard my man, too. <laughs> 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 right. But, you know, I mean, but I was a scorer, man. I mean, like, you know, so for me, that's where all my confidence come from, you know, is being able to. You know, put that ball in the basket, man, with regularity, man. And coming from that two guard, it just changed my career. I, I never get it. I, I I was playing against Phoenix. And what's the guard in Phoenix back then? Um, Bad boy. Paul Westball. Paul Westball. Paul Westball told me, he said, man, why don't you go back down to the forward? I said, well, why am I going to do that? You guarding me. <laughs> right. <laughs> And I, I never forget that, man. Paul, they want you to go back down to the three or four. I say, for real, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, but it did, man. That changed my career, man. I, I'm a Hall of Famer because Bob made that move. You know, wow. I didn't make it. Bob made it. 
You know, he saw something that I didn't see. You know, and then once I got there, I mean, I didn't have to, you know, I didn't have to work as hard. Mm -hmm. Talk about your relationship that you developed over the years and that you still have now with San Antonio Spurs organization. Man, I'm still working for the Spurs, man, after all these years. Me and Scoop talk about it, man, when I, I hate I left. You know, mindset, man, where, you know, uh, and, you know, a lot of guys going to have to deal with this. You know, I was here. You know, I was on top of it. I was on top of my game. Nobody stay on top forever. The biggest challenge for athletes is when you start doing this. You know, we all going to stay up here. You know, and Cotton Fitzsimmons came in. And uh, Cotton wanted me to come off the bench. I wasn't ready. You know, and me not being ready, man, uh, another career change. And, and the organization didn't want me to leave. The organization said, man, instead of go, man, we'll pay you to stay home. I just wasn't ready. You know, and I went to Chicago, man. I mean, so for me, to have an organization, man, like San Antonio Spurs, man, it's, it's like never before. They've been so good to me and so appreciative of what I contribute to this organization that they still pay me today. The things that I do and the things that they have me doing, I mean, it's, it's incredible. Man, I've seen the eras, my era, David era, Tim era. Now we got Victor. I've been there from the beginning, and they make me feel like I'm still playing. You know, I mean, how incredible is that for a relationship between a franchise and a former player. Ain't many. Now, I ain't saying ain't none, but ain't many. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, and the feeling is uh, overwhelming, man. I mean, you know, when you sit down and meditate on it, you know, think about it and, and think about, you know, all these years uh, that then went past and, and this franchise still recognized, uh, you know, me as being part of that foundation, uh, you know, you always got people ask you, man, well, man, who's the greatest spur? And I always use analogy of a tree. You know, I'm the roots. David is the trunk and Tim is the branches and the flowers. So ask yourself, what's the most valuable part of that tree? Because if this die, the whole tree dies. So you ask yourself. Who's the most valuable player of that franchise? You know, so I mean, you look in the mirror and ask yourself. I ain't got to tell you. Mm. You know, I mean, so you know, it's a, it's a narrative that, you know, people like to push. You know, so I come up with a narrative that make you think, because you know, I think man, basketball one of the only sports man that they always compare players. You don't hear that much in all of these other sports. But you hear that a lot, man, who the GOAT is. Who cares? You know, I don't care. Me and, me and Scoop got another article and talking about 75 greatest. Mm -hmm. Scoop talk about that. Mm -hmm. You know, and stuff, man. So, you know, you look at life, uh, Lamont, I mean, and for me, you know, I, I look at life like it is. You know, we all was blessed, man, just to have this opportunity that God gave us this gift. You know, to play this game, man, for so long, man. And I believe in relationships. You know, what drives me is relationships. You know, the question of school back in my relationship with San Antonio Spur is like no other. Well, they definitely have a culture that is unique to the league. Um, pretty special organization. And Popovich has, you know, continued it. And uh, they've got big things on the horizon. Mm -hmm. Question for you. Well, I'm going to go back for a second because I, I mean, this is a, a historical event. The 77 78 season, 
you engaged in a scoring battle with David Thompson for the league scoring championship. My question for you is, and, and I think I remember the order of it, I think you played after him that day. Did you go out with the objective of winning it that better day? believe it. You better believe it. <laughs> See, because he played before me. I right. led the league scoring all the way until that game. And they let him in Detroit, you know, have an opportunity to score as many points as he could. And he did a pretty great job about it, too. You know, I'm a big fan of David T's. You know, uh, everything was – the stage was set. You know, uh, there ain't never been a stage set like that ever again in pro sports. They they try to make it, but, you know, for this – me and him both had, what, 27 – we just got percentage points. So, you know, the after he got his 7-3, and then after he broke Wilt's record with 32 and a quarter, then it was my turn. I knew all this, you know what I mean, which was an advantage for me. Um, and his coach and my coach were buddies, and they always competed, Larry and Mo. Oh, man, ain't that sound Larry and Mo? <laughs> <laughs> Think about that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I better say they last day, Larry Brown and Doug. Right, Mo, right, right. Right, right, right. I don't right, want that right, right. to come off like right, that, right. man. But, that but them brothers always, you know, they had a passion for each other, you know, respect. Mm -hmm. So Doug, Doug boy came to me and said, I just, um, we going to get that going right back. He said that little. S-H-I-T, I know what he did, you know, and uh, and went over the locker room, man. He told the guys, he said, man, look here, man, uh, David Thompson just took scoring time for ice, man. We, you know, we want ice to try to get it back. What y'all think? All my guys said, hey, yeah. So we went out, you know, with that intention. Now, I had to go in and get 59. Now, I'm starting the game. Knowing I need 59. Yeah, you know, you say a little pressure, you know. Uh, and I went out, man, first six shot, missed them. And, you know, I, I, I didn't feel it. I mean, and then I went back, man, I said, hey, man, come on, don't even worry about it, man. And, you know, and, you know I, I told school I was just kidding, <laughs> you know, but I still wanted my guys, you know. It, it, we still in it. They said, come on, Ives, come on, man. Encourage me. And I went back out, got 20 in that quarter. So the second quarter started, and I'm, I'm, I'm in it now, you know, and got 33. So, you know, the funniest thing to me, man, that's why I love David so much, man. He played into this scenario so beautiful, man. I mean, I heard him say it. He said, man, I went out, got 73, and. That broke Wilkes' record, man. It took what, how many years to break Wilkes' record? And Gervin came five hours later and broke my record. <laughs> <laughs> right. I never, I never forget hearing him say that, man. I right. mean, that was so special, you know. So I ended up getting thirty. So I had fifty-three at half. I only needed fifty-nine. So it took me a bunch of more shots. I was, I knew I was there then, you know. So I started goofing around. I mean, and. You know, and I took another 15 some shots and, and ended up getting 59. And then I told Coach, I said, Coach, let me get a few more points just in case they miscalculated. <laughs> and that's how I got 63. Okay. You know, that's how I got 63, man. So, you know, I, Pete Mavis was on the New Orleans at that ten, time. Pete and didn't play. So Pete was rooting me on, man. Come on, I ain't, you know, I mean, I, I, man, that, you know, again, that's that everybody needed somebody, man. Come on, man, two artists, that's what I call it, respecting each other, you know, because we know who he was. He was an artist, you know, and he was rooting me on, you know, and I ended up, man, doing it, man, getting 63 and 33 minutes, you know, and hindsight, you know, it, which is it's not worth a quarter. 
you start thinking about the history of the game, you start thinking about guys getting 70 and 80 and Wilk getting 100. I'm on a streak where I, I could have got some numbers, mm-hmm. but I got what I wanted, and that's all I needed. You know, so that to me is NBA history at its best when you talk about the final duel of a scoring. Uh, there ain't been another one like it. Now, they keep trying to make one like Shaq and David Robinson had one, I think. Kevin Durant and somebody else had one. But it, the significance wasn't as great. I'm very proud, man, to have that that game. And it was against David, man, because he definitely, man, is one of the all-time greats in my eyes. Hey, Lamont, um, let me throw a caveat in here, too. First, the thing about Pete Maravich is important to this story because Pete Maravich led the league in scoring at that time, that year before he got injured. He was leading the league in scoring. And he got hurt, so he was out for the rest of the season. So to have somebody that had the scoring title rooting on somebody else to take a score, you know what I'm saying, at the mm-hmm. same time, mm-hmm. says a lot about like that because – George and they were playing in New Orleans at that time. So, you know, Pete was like, hey, I'm rooting on somebody else. And sure. actually, the scoring title is supposed to be mine. I just happen to be hurt. So that says a lot about that, you know, which, right. which I always thought was really big. And another part of the story that George didn't tell you is how wore out he was after oh. that game. <laughs> they, wow. they, they, they all tried to go out and celebrate. Guess who didn't go out and celebrate? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Think about Amanda. Okay, I need 59. So, you know, the game is played mental. I don't care who you are. you got to have a mentality to be able to be successful in all our work. School, writing, you, you know, dealing with other people. This is what get tired. You know, my body was tired. But this, this is what kept me from going out. I was <laughs> mentally, sure. I was mentally dead without focus. You know, I mean, think about it, man. I mean, that's what we want, man. We want people to be able, man, to stay focused, man, when it's time. You know, I mean, that's where your success comes from. If you lose your focus, man, you probably lose whatever you're trying to accomplish. You know, that's where greatness comes from. What make Tiger great? He was talented. Tiger made pars when he had to. But we always talk about the birdies and the eagles. He had to be mentally tough to make a par when everybody else thought he couldn't. You know, so. Mm. And that's what this show is about. What it takes to be great. And you you summed it up right there. Yeah. 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 You summed it up. You two have a forthcoming book coming out. And and we always want to... elevate our guests and and find out what they're doing now and what's on the agenda. Um, you guys want to share the name of the, the book and when it's coming out? Uh, is it named yet? Yep. Yep, it sure is. It's funny because it's a combination of what? Two different ideas, George? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no. It's called Ice, Why I Was Born to Score. And it's the autobiography of George Gervin. And how we came up with the title was the publisher company really wanted to push Ice or Ice Man because that's kind of how he's publicly known. George said from the very beginning, Johnny Davis told him, George, if you ever do a book, you should title the book Born to Score. And if mm-hmm. you know George's life, and he'll attest to this, it's not just scoring on the basketball court. You know, his story is really, in my mind, and he, I think, will agree with it, it's a redemption story about everything throughout his life that he's had to overcome. So he looks at scoring as not just putting the ball in the hole. He looks at scoring in all aspects of life. You know, scoring in fatherhood, scoring in faith, scoring in business, scoring in his marriage, scoring in overcoming, you know, the stuff he had to go through, you know, while dealing in the NBA, you know, just all some of the setbacks he's had in life, scoring that, you know, scoring in his relationship with the Spurs and how long that's lasted, 
scoring in how long he's been with a relationship with like Nike. Scoring in that. So he, he's always looked at scoring as something bigger than the NBA, but he's able to apply it to what he did in basketball and what he did best in basketball. So in telling the story, we wanted to come to a agreement, you know, a kind of a center place where the publishers were happy with the use of the name Ice or Ice Man. And he was happy with the part about how he looks at scoring going beyond just basketball and how it works in life and in his, you know, his life specifically. So it's symbolic. You know what I'm saying? Go, you know, we first look at it, you're saying, how he's scoring. And we're saying, like, wait a minute, now you got to get into this. You know what I mean? Because that, that part, two hours you see me. You don't see me in them 20 other two. You know, what's going on in a man's life? You know, it's like any sport. You know, who is he? You know what I mean? I'm just like you. You know, that's what this book do. You know, that's where, how he wrote it for me. You don't get to know who I am. When does the book come out? October 31st, Halloween. Halloween. I'm going to dress up as Iceman on Halloween. I got to grow like about a foot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, you, you, I you got, got a lot of work to do, school. I got a lot of work to do, Lamar. You know that, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no it, it's beautiful, man. I appreciate school, man, and how he wrote it and, you know, how we talked. You know, and we talked about, you know, issues that's happening today. We talked about people that had different issues. We talked about mental health. You know, these are the things that are not being addressed, but a lot of our brothers and sisters have mental health issues, and people are just not starting to talk about them. The, the book cover, you can't miss it. It's going to jump out to you and hit you in the face. <laughs> you know, and so, you know, that's the, that's the beauty, man. But then all that still come from, like Scoop said, it's the relationship that I have with Knight. I'm a relationship guy. You know, and you'll be able to tell that once you do some reading. That's lifelong living relationship, you know. And if you ain't got them... I mean, you think about it, man. The richest guy in the world, man. You know, most of them unhappy because they ain't got no real relationship. They got all the money in the world, man. They go home, man. Go to that big old house, man, and they'll say, hey, and, it's, and, and they'll say, hey, and they say, hey, 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 hey. It echoes because ain't nobody in there. Mm -hmm. You know, I come to my house, man. I say, hey, honey. Hey, guys. And I hear a voice. Man, ain't nothing greater than that, man. For an athlete, to have that man after he done, come on, man. You an agent, mm -hmm. you know for yourself. Okay, you didn't have all this, man, but what's real in life? Relationships. There you go. If you ain't got that, what you got? Right. You know what I'm saying? You got something that can spin, man. You can buy everything you want, man. All you do is... The domino effect, man. They keep buying the same thing. It's just newer. You know, Scoop helped me portray this in this book, man. You know, my bride, man, of 47 years, man. Come on, man. I couldn't make it without her. You know, and her insight and her faith. You know, and I, I, he told me, you know, it's what we're writing about. Yeah. You know, because people need to hear that. People need to understand that, man. You know, it got to be more than just about you. And that's, sure. yeah, I can say that the book is not necessarily about his life, but it is about life. You know what I'm saying? That, that's kind of the way I took it and, and we wrote it in a way because insight that he has and using that insight to have everybody get a different outlook on life. But at the center of it is his life, but it's still about life, not necessarily just his life. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Before we get out, I want you to, talk to us about when did the Hall of Fame, or you getting into the Hall of Fame, when did that click in your mind? When did that hit you? Like, at what point in your career did you like, okay, I'm pretty sure I'm getting into the Hall of Fame. When, when did that happen? Never thought it. Never entered my mind. You know, because uh, I ain't played to be a part of the Hall of Fame. I played it, loved it, I did the best I can, man, when I could, man. And as it was over, man, it was it was over for me. Now these honors, 
I ain't never look at it, man. And you know, thank God, you know, when I finished the NBA, I went overseas. And they asked me about the Hall of Fame. Somebody asked me about the Hall of Fame. They tell me, you know, you only get in the Hall of Fame five years after you retire. See, but I went to overseas. So they said I had to wait another five years. So I had to wait 10 years. Get it on. You know what I mean? So, you know, for me, I mean, to be able to make it and it's one of the you know greatest honor a man a, a sports guy can have, especially um that basketball career I had you know compete against the, that greatness. Mm-hmm. I had greatness back then, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I I ain't taken from these guys today by no means. It's they turn, but back then, you know, there's a lot of great Hall of Famers, man, that I played against. Man, I could not beat them Lakers. <laughs> I'm still, I'm still, I'm still man. Right. <laughs> well, they, they, they were pretty good, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you got to lose, that, yeah, you can <laughs> lose it to the right ones. <laughs> if you got to lose, so, you so, know, so. But when I did school, it, it was it was real special. You oh. know that same as the top fifty. Yeah. You know, I mean, because I never won a championship. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, so. You know, to hear guys, man, talk about championships, I mean, obviously that's what we play for, you know. But I played the game because I loved it, man. I tried to win a championship, and I didn't. And it don't take from my game. I mean, it don't take from my career now. You could try to sell it. If you ain't win a championship, you know, you ain't have a fulfillment of your career. I'm saying, who you fooling? And who's saying it? It got to be somebody saying that it ain't played because you don't know. I mean, it was hard what I did, man. I come up out of the streets of Detroit, man. I went from bread lines to headlines. And you going to tell me I ain't have a great career? Choo. Who you talking to? <laughs> <laughs> tell our listeners what you're doing now. Um, you know, obviously I know uh, you're, you're, you're coaching in the big three. How, how is that? Are you enjoying it? Uh, how's the league coming along? Give us your thoughts on that. Big three, man. I've been doing it for six years. Ice Cube created a league, a uh, three-on-three league for retired athlete, you know, basketball players, man, to kind of give them another stage. You know, a lot of guys that play, you know, didn't want to have to retire, you know, circumstance made them retire, you know, uh, you know, league passed them around, but they still wanted to play. So he created this venue, which is, it, it, I think it's perfect. You know, we play three on three. You know, we go around the country playing in the arenas that the NBA play in. We got some great guys that still want to play, that plays real well. Um, you know, as the league you know, get older and stuff, you know, we added and, and got a few more younger guys to play, you know, that played in Europe. You know, so they didn't necessarily have to come out of the NBA. So it's a great league, man. I I really enjoy it, man. They play hard, hard nosed basketball like we did back in the day. You know, it, it's physical. You ain't gonna just come on in here and think you're gonna dominate. You know, you got to get used to it. That's how tough it is. But I I enjoy it. I really appreciate Cube and Jeff um, creating this. You know, this opportunity for these guys, man. So that's what I do. Uh, for 10 weeks in the summer. And, you know, I still have my own charter school here. I have a charter school for 30 years. So we really have a, a big impact on this community here in San Antonio. And also have a charter school in uh, uh, in Arizona called the George Gervin Preparatory, you know, school. Uh, it's a pre-K to eighth grade. And, you know, so that's kind of like what I do. And then I hit that golf ball. You know, I try to hit it where I can find it most of the time. and. It works. Um, uh, golfers, you know, who's li- our listeners, man, I had one of the greatest um, shots that I ever made. Man, I had an albatross on a, a par five. You know, I hit a nice drive, and then I hit a three-wood in the hole. People talk about holding ones, but you ask them about an albatross. It very rarely ever happened, you know. Um, so I, I'm, I'm proud of that, man, and, and, and you know, I'm, I'm actually bragging. You know, I mean, because that's something that don't never be, hardly never be done. You know, so, and that's what I do, man. I mean, and then I, you know, obviously I just had my 47th anniversary with my, my bride. 
I got seven grandkids and I got three kids that I love to death, man. So we just, I took them all to Disney a month ago. Took 15 of them to Disney. So I, I'm looking for another job. If uh, any, <laughs> <laughs> so man, I appreciate this, man. Scoop, uh, man, I appreciate having this opportunity, man. To be on your Hall of Fame show. Uh, do not anything but wish you uh, much luck, and you can get a lot more guys, man. That you know, deserving to hear their story. Yeah. Sure, sure. Well, we appreciate you. This is a fascinating journey you took us on, and I'm sure it's even going to be even deeper in the book when it comes out. So we're going to have all our listeners go out and pick up George's book because this is just the tip of the iceberg and, you know, spread the word about Hall of Famers. And that's a wrap for us. And until the next time, keep reaching for the stars. <laughs>